This video is brought to you by John Robson Guitar Tuition. If you enjoy the content, please consider supporting the channel by enrolling on a course, purchasing some guitar lessons or a t-shirt, or you can join my Patreon. Now, on with the show. Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. Today it's Tuesday, so we're doing a top five list, or more accurately, we're doing the first half of a top ten. Had this idea for doing um, basically significant, important electric guitars. These could be guitars which essentially revolutionized the industry or defined a particular genre of music or just became culturally important in some other way. For example, it's well known that the electric guitar is um, often used as a, as a shorthand way of expressing uh, youthful rebelliousness, rock and roll, making things seem a bit edgy. Advertisers have been keen to this for a long time. If you're an advertiser and you want to make your product seem a little bit cooler, then just stick an electric guitar in the advert job done. doesn't matter whether that product is flavoured sugary water or online gambling or manly perfume for manly eyeshadow wearing men. Stick an electric guitar in the ad, job done, sorted. So here is what I think are probably 10 of the most culturally significant and revolutionary electric guitars of all time, starting with... Origins. Okay, our story begins with these two fellas here, Adolf Rickenbacker, an established uh, musical instrument manufacturer, and uh, George Beecham. I always thought his uh, his surname was pronounced Beauchamp or something like that. But turns out it is just a fancy spelling of Beecham. And uh, George was a lap steel guitarist playing the popular Hawaiian music of the day in the 1920s, and he was on a quest for more volume. He'd already worked with the Dupiera brothers, I believe, of the uh, you know the the Dobro Resonator guitar fame, uh, but still wanted more volume. And he had this crazy idea that you could somehow make a guitar louder via the use of electricity. So he took this idea to Rickenbacker, and together they came up with this instrument, the frying pan. Now it doesn't look much like the kind of guitar that you or I would play. You know, you couldn't pick it up and rattle out "Sweet Child of Mine." or smoke on the water or stairway to heaven or any of the other things that will get you thrown out of a guitar shop but nevertheless it's a six-stringed instrument it's tuned like a guitar and it's made louder by the use of electricity um, it featured a hitherto unheard of or um, you know brand new technology let's call it of an electromagnetic pickup this shows you how the guitar was intended to be played as I say as a lap steel guitar so it's a guitar it's tuned like a guitar it's got six strings and it's made louder via the use of electricity this really got the ball rolling and started the revolution let's see where it went after that going mainstream okay next up we have to talk about this fella here Charlie Christian uh, Christian played a Gibson ES-150 guitar, which after Christian's death in 1942 became known simply as the Gibson Charlie Christian guitar. Um, basically, Gibson had cottoned on to the fact that um, you could put one of these newfangled electronic electromagnetic pickups onto an acoustic guitar and make it louder, and that was the ES-150. ES stood for Electric Spanish because it was played like a regular Spanish guitar uh, rather than across your lap like a lap steel guitar that we've just been talking about. And uh, the 150 referred to the number of dollars that it cost to buy. Uh, so hence ES-150. Now, Charlie Christian was um, a jazz guitarist um, at, the, at the dawn of jazz guitar. And he was discovered by legendary American music producer John Hammond, whose career spanned a big part of the 20th century. He's responsible for managing and producing people like Benny Goodman, who we're going to come to in a moment right the way through to discovering and, and mentoring and, you know, kind of taking under his wing people like uh, Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen. So, you know, a bit of a musical polymath. Anyway, he uh, discovered Charlie Christian and essentially snuck him onto the bandstand at a Benny Goodman gig. And Goodman was none too happy about this because he didn't really have much time for this newfangled electric guitar malarkey. Um, so he 
basically called out a tune called Rose Room and uh, thinking that Christian would be unfamiliar with this tune. But little did uh, Goodman know that Christian could listen to a chord sequence and uh, hear it once and then just effortlessly improvise over it. The version of Rose Room that the band played that night uh, lasted apparently about 40 minutes with Goodman and Christian trading solos and, you know, playing a, a game of sort of musical one-upmanship uh, all evening and from that moment on Charlie Christian let's have another look at him here he is was a fully bona fide qualified member of the Benny Goodman uh, sextet I think it was and later the Benny Goodman orchestra this really did cement the electric guitar because Benny Goodman was a rock star of his day this cemented the electric guitar as you know part of the mainstream and you know no history of the electric guitar would be complete without the Gibson ES-150 or Charlie Christian and the man, the guitar, the partnership. You know, thanks to John Hammond and Benny Goodman, they had a big impact on uh, making the electric guitar part of mainstream culture. Let's see where we go after this. The Bolt-On Revolution. Yes, now the traditional way that you would build or assemble an electric guitar is that you would have a neck and a body. Both would be made from timber, and the way you would join those two pieces of wood together would be with traditional carpentry and cabinet-making methods, basically a mortise and tenon joint, uh, you know, glued together. And this means that if you're in the business of uh, building guitars in that way, your production line is going to be staffed by people with, you know, skills, craftsmen, people who know how to do those kind of uh, carpentry and cabinet making uh, kind of things, basically. And then along comes this chap, Leo Fender. And in the late 40s, uh, he kind of had a bit of a what seemed like a revolutionary idea at the time. Well, why don't we just bolt the two pieces of wood together, or more accurately, use wood screws. He was working out of his small radio repair shop and uh, retail outlet in Fullerton, California. And this was a place where basically whatever it was that was electrical, you went and bought it from his shop, because that was where you bought your electrical goods, including electric guitars and the associated paraphernalia, uh, like amplifiers and so on. And he was listening to the concerns of the local musicians, many of whom were his customers, and he started forming ideas ideas of what an electric guitar could be. One of the concerns people had was, well, you know, can we get something that doesn't cause this feedback? You see, the thing is, if you have a hollow-bodied electric guitar and you turn the volume up, it's going to feed back. You're going to get that horrible howl round feedback that um, is just inherent with uh, amplifying any acoustic, essentially acoustic instrument. So Leo thought, well, why don't we just make it solid? You know, let's, it's not really accurate to say that uh, Leo invented the solid-bodied electric guitar. There were others around that predate Fender guitars, and there is another pioneer of the electric guitar that we'll be looking at later, who, hold, who you probably know I'm talking about already, who also was thinking along similar lines. But it's fair to say that Leo was certainly a pioneer of the solid-bodied electric guitar. You add into the mix the fact that he um, was able to mass-produce electric guitars through bolting the necks on, and he also came up with a, um, a, a very clever way of cutting the fret slots very accurately and, and de-skilling that whole part of the process. No longer with Leo Fender's method of cutting the uh, fret slots did you need, you know, a meticulous craftsman with an accurate ruler and a sharp pencil to mark out where the frets needed to go. He came up with a fantastically simple and brilliant way of um, cutting the fret slots accurately, quickly, and again. Just bringing the costs down and if we take a look at one of his uh, prototypes from the late 40s, you can begin to see it all coming together here. You know, the headstock changed a little bit, um, you know, in, in, in the coming years, and it gained an extra pickup. But I think we can all recognize the, the Telecaster DNA in uh, what we're looking at there. So... Leo Fender, yeah, he really did. He was more like a, a Henry Ford of the electric guitar world, really. He made uh, electric guitars available to the masses, and that is undeniably part of what made the electric guitar as big a part of um, our culture from 
that point on than I would say anything else really. Let's see where the story goes next. The log they laughed at. As I said, Leo Fender was not the only pioneer of the electric guitar who had the bright idea of making the body solid to avoid feedback. At this stage of our story, we say hello to this chap, Lester William Polfus, better known as Les Paul. By the early 50s, he was an established performer and he was struggling with feedback issues. Basically, If you become a popular entertainer and you're playing big venues, you need to crank up the volume so that uh, you can be heard right at the back row. And if you've got a hollow-bodied electric guitar, then the sound comes out of the speaker, gets gets hits the um, the hollow body of the electric guitar that gets picked up by the pickup, goes down the wire out the speaker, and you get this kind of feedback loop going on. Les was struggling with this, so what he did was he uh, basically home-built a solid-bodied electric guitar nicknamed The Log for obvious reasons. And he took this design to his preferred manufacturer, Gibson, and said, would you build this for me commercially? And apparently it was all they could do to contain their laughter while they escorted him off the premises. Uh, Then, you know, along comes this chap building guitars that look a bit like this, solid-bodied, you see, and basically starts eating into Gibson's market share a little bit. So they said, let's get that crazy guy with that uh, solid-bodied electric guitar back in here, and let's talk to him about it. And the Gibson Les Paul was born. This is a 1952 example, and you can see it's basically the um, largely the same as the Gibson Les Paul you can go out and buy today. The pickups have changed, and that weird trapeze wrap-under tailpiece bridge kind of thing uh, didn't stay the journey. But but it's basically the formula was was set. And the Gibson Les Paul is, I think, one of the defining sounds of the electric guitar. If, as we um, mentioned at the beginning of the video, you accept that the sound of an electric guitar or the, 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 the electric guitar itself is a huge part of our culture, then the Gibson Les Paul is a good part of that i mean it's it's a bit of a simplification but not much of one to say that you've got the fender sound and the gibson sound it's you know the fender sound um transparent sweet hollow um you know light and you know somewhat thin sounding and the gibson sound which is you know largely typified by the les paul which has uh, an air of gravitas and authority and fatness to it uh whether it's Eric Clapton plugging into um, a Marshall valve amplifier for the the Beano album, or Mike Bloomfield around about the same time, or going on into the 70s, the sound of rock bands like uh, Thin Lizzy spring to mind, uh, you know, or all the way through. You know, from there on in, basically, you know, the, the Les Paul tone has become essentially what defines a large part of what we think of as rock guitar. And that's a massive cultural phenomenon. So that's why Les Paul had to be on the list. Let's see where we go next with this. The electric guitar. Now, I suppose many of us who took up the guitar in childhood probably spent a fair bit of time sitting at the back of the class and doodling on the back of uh, exercise books trying to draw an electric guitar. There was always one shape, one outline, one silhouette that we were trying to kind of uh, get close to in our little uh, doodlings. And um, if you go on to Google and just search in the broadest terms possible for electric guitar, as you can see here, there is uh, always one shape that always seems to come pretty near or at the top of the uh, search results. Of course, it is the Fender Stratocaster. It is pretty much the uh, the shape, the the look, the icon of electric guitars. That even somebody who doesn't play the guitar, non musicians, civilians, as I call them, will always think of when you you know broach the term electric guitar. That is what they they think of. Leo Fender in 1954 came up with this design along with um, his cohorts, uh, mainly uh, Freddie Tavares and, I believe, uh, a, a local musician called Bill Carson. They came up with this idea. Basically, he'd already established himself as a serious player in the electric guitar industry with the uh, the Telecaster, um, but people were wanting some refinements to it. The square band sword 
plank-edged body of the uh, Telecaster, people, a lot of people found that uncomfortable. So can we have some contours, some comfort concessions, please? And can we have an extra pickup? And can we have a built-in vibrato unit rather than having to bolt on an aftermarket Bigsby or something like that? And Leo listened to all of these uh, concerns and came up with the design you've just seen there. In 1954, the Stratocaster was launched. It is, as I said, just an iconic image of the electric guitar. And I just think it's just incredible that Leo Fender, a man who, till the day he died, never learned to play a note of music on the guitar, designed what has become possibly or probably or some would say definitely the most definitive electric guitar ever made think of how many modern bands that are producing music that couldn't have been foreseen in 1954 still use what is essentially the same design of guitar the thing about the, 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 the Stratocaster is if we compare it to the other iconic electric guitar, the Les Paul, the Les Paul has the Les Paul tone. We recognize it, we know it, we love it, and we, uh, we appreciate the sound of it, and it's, it's a big part of, uh, rock music. But the Stratocaster, yeah, the Stratocaster has the Stratocaster tone, but I would say that the Stratocaster, uh, gives you, you know, rather than just the Stratocaster tone, it gives you the Mark Knopfler tone. It gives you the Hank Marvin tone. It gives you the Jimi Hendrix tone. It gives you the Jeff Beck tone. It gives you the Richie Blackmore tone. Jeff Beck himself actually summed it up brilliantly once in an interview where he said, a Les Paul gives you its sound. A, Stratoc a Stratocaster gives you your sound, which I think is just a brilliantly simple way of putting it. There is no way that we can um, conclude part one of our list of iconic electric guitars that have either you know, had a massive cultural impact or revolutionized the electric guitar industry without finishing on the Fender Stratocaster. It is, as I said, just an iconic you know, kind of cultural phenomenon, and it had to be at the end of our list today. And that is where we draw matters to a close for part one of this video. I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen, and uh, if that's the case, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already done so. And why not give me a like while you're at it? Part two will be following on next week. Um, I wonder if you can already um, think about what uh, what guitars might be in part two of the list. There's probably one or two surprises there that uh, might take you um you know by surprise <laughs> uh, as we say uh, but i hope i make a strong case when the time comes for why those guitars deserve a place on the list and that is pretty much it as i've said folks uh, thank you so much for watching i hope you've enjoyed the video and all of that uh, don't forget the live stream every friday 5 p.m uk time we drink beer we talk music we talk guitars i suspect this discussion will be um you know factoring in the live stream uh, you know people comment on it and so on and uh, yeah it's a great way to kick off the weekend I would love to see you there if you can make it but for now I'll bid you all a good day and say thank you so much for watching thank you for your time look after yourselves folks stay well stay safe and above all stay sane bye for now